Hello, everybody, and welcome to week 11 of our time together. We're closing in on the 20th century, though we must visit Asia again and see what changes have taken place in the Asian uh, territories and countries of India, China, and Japan between 1800, well, actually 1850 and 1914. Now, before we go too much further, I would like to review. And I want you to think about what term, which was poorly based upon evolutionary theory articulated by Charles Darwin, was used to justify colonialism in Africa. If you said social Darwinism, you're correct. Social Darwinism is a corruption of Darwin's theory on the evolution of species. In Darwin's view, evolution happens to the most adaptive, not the strongest. However, in social Darwinism, it's believed that those who are strong rule because they deserve to rule because they are strong. The weak deserve to be subjugated because they are weak. So now what policy wherein subjugated people are taught to hate each other made ruling in Africa, as well as other places, easier for Europeans? If you said divide and rule, you're right. Divide and rule is an age old governance trick. Uh, it happens even today. If you think about certain pol political movements across the globe, whether it's domestic or abroad, there are certain politicians and certain pundits who gleefully engage in pitting one social group against another social group. It could be superfluous divisions, things like territoriality or regionalism or accents or this um, rural urban divide, could be a divide of education. It could even be a little bit more um, overt racial differences, religious differences, economic differences, or even just political differences. Things like whether you are uh, belonging to one party or another party. Divide and rule is a very useful tactic, but it is extremely corrosive and destructive in the long run. When you undermine your country's unity, when you start pitting the populace against each other, you're really opening a Pandora's box that is almost impossible to overcome. And this will lead to a lot of trouble further on down the road. So in African colonies, what was the real purpose of infrastructure such as railroads or telegraph lines or new ports? Ostensibly, according to the Berlin Conference, it was to improve the lives of the people in Africa. But what was the real reason? If you said it was to export resources, you're absolutely right. It is no accident in Africa that a lot of the ports a lot of the railroads, a lot of the telegraph lines, and other infrastructure, everything from roads to power later on in the 20th century, you know, like electricity, uh, to water pumping, those are all concentrated on port cities, uh, on exporting these resources and making life easier for Europeans, not necessarily easier for the people living in Africa. Now compare this to England, where there was a lot of resource extraction, absolutely, but an ancillary business, the movement of people across vast distances, a good example would be England and the use of railroads, and how very quickly those went from just being a purview of the mines to transporting goods to factories, to transporting people to factories and to other cities, and the movement of information. Compare that to Africa, and you see it is a very much a one-way street of extracting as much as possible, as efficiently as possible, with very little regard for the welfare of the people living in Africa. So let's talk about the keys that were important to colonialism. Eventually, we're going to wind up with colonial rule, but there's a lot of things that come into play. The first thing that comes into play is, of course, technology. Technology. 
Technology changes the way in which Europeans interact with the rest of the world, particularly Africa, as well as other countries. Key to this is the access to resources and the need for resources. Without this need for resources, there's no point in uh, colonizing. It's a good reason why some areas were never really colonized because they didn't have the right kind of resources that the Europeans wanted. A good example of using technology to get those resources is the medicines that were used to treat things like malaria. Quinine, for example, would, had been around for quite some time, since about the 17th century, but it really wasn't affined into medical efficacy until the 19th century and widely distributed. To this day, uh, one of the favorite alcoholic beverages of Ang uh, the English people is gin and tonics. The tonics were a um, seltzer water that had this quinine in it. it leaves a very bitter taste in your mouth and so the gin was used to kind of cover that uh, bitter taste and by intaking a lot of quinine you kind of bolster your system against the uh, the parasite that causes uh, malaria another key to colonialism is demand and that's built partly on technology and built partly on the need for resources. And that is fueled by mechanization. There had always been a demand for resources. A good example would be tobacco, cotton, sugar, spices, lumber, all of that are reasons why the Western Hemisphere was colonized and created plantations and mines and lumber camps and that sort. As mechanization picked up, the demand for those resources increased uh, and so you also have the demand to pacify the local population as more and more resources are extracted, as more and more people's livelihoods and way of life are threatened, they become more restive. And so you have the use of guns, more increasingly efficient weapons. Now there's a very hit and miss rep um, reputation with using guns to pacify and a very hit and miss results as well. Um, sometimes it worked very well for them, sometimes it did not work very well for the Europeans. And then of course we have politics. Politics is also another key to colonialism. Were there not the political will to exploit resources, to utilize guns to pacify the locals, there would not have really been this kind of colonialism. Part and parcel of this is the status that comes along with having a wide-flung empire. Lots of territory, lots of people in which you rule. Uh, this is particularly a, 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 an incredibly important point for 19th century British rule, uh, British society as well. And then finally, uh, divide and rule, or DNR, as we, min as we uh, talked about earlier. Uh, divide and rule was necessary in order to keep resistance decentralized, in order to insulate Europeans from any kind of reprisals, and to basically make it easier to extract resources. If, you're, if you were to uh, take an example of breaking into somebody else's house, if you could maybe get the two residents who are in the house to be busy arguing and fighting against each other, it's easier to steal things from within their house. It's a good example. So all of these form a kind of matrix, a, a, a building up of influences that eventually lead to colonial rule in Africa. And as we'll see, a lot of that gets played out in Asia as well. But before we dive too much deeper, let's talk about some new terms. First, the Indian National Congress. The Indian National Congress is, are educated middle-class Indians, those who live in India, who used English law against English administrators of India to agitate for incremental reform, including things like self-rule within the British Empire. Now, this was initially started as a kind of, um, uh, it came from a reformist point of view and the idea that uh, the colonizing mission really was to spread civilization and to spread 
uh, ways of governance to these uh, provinces. Um, perhaps a little wide-eyed and maybe a little naive, uh, but also uh, very genuine in the belief that uh, England had some kind of moral obligation to impart democracy and democratic uh, practices onto India. Although how democratic they are, well, we'll leave that up to your judgment as we go through the, the lecture. Second is the Boxer Rebellion. In 1900, this was uh, an attempt by peasants to overthrow not only a corrupt, ineffectual government, but also to oust Europeans and the Japanese, who they saw as um, invading and taking over China and uh, destroying their way of life. Now, it was eventually put down by a coalition of 12 different nations, which also included the United States and Japan, a little late to the game in the United States was, but more than eager to help put down the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, now, let's move on to why Japan suddenly becomes a player in the divvying up and the putting down of China. And that is largely due to the Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration is a generation-long project, it lasts for about 35 to about 40 years, wherein the Japanese society is taken from a very um, stilted, stifled, closed society to a much more modern, much more industrialized nation. And we'll talk about some of the factors that play into why Japan becomes a special case for not falling victim to colonization the way that India and China do. Part of it has to do with something called gunboat diplomacy. Gunboat diplomacy was is the essentially using of force to uh, force a change in the relationship between two countries. So using military might to change minds. Uh, it's very advantageous for some nations to negotiate at gunpoint. Uh, one thing that, uh, that the famed gangster Al Capone said, it was always much easier to get what you want with a kind word and a gun than it was with just a kind word. So that is not untrue, especially in the realm of international politics. So here we are at India in the 1850s, and when we last left off, when we talked a little bit about nationalization and we talked about national identity, we hinted at this, that there was a kind of rebellion that happened in the 1850s. Now, depending on your point of view, the Indian First uh, War of Independence or the so-called so -called Sepoy Mutiny led to monumental changes in the way that Britain interacted with India. By that, I mean no longer were private companies, uh, in this case, the East India Company, in charge of kind of an ad hoc administration. Instead, the English crown took direct control, ostensibly to expand rights and to meet the needs of the Indian people. But as we'll see, maybe that wasn't really the case. Because between 1857 and 1947, about 90 years, the British uh, government instituted a series of monopolistic orders, very much against the laissez-faire capitalist ideas that had been dominating English politics for about 40 years. Remember, 1857, we're not too far away from the Irish potato famine, in which the laissez-faire attitude towards uh, famine relief exacerbated some of the issues that uh, that happened in Ireland, led to the deaths of millions, led to the exportation or the, the diaspora of millions of others, and really uh, struck a, a horrible blow against uh, the Irish. But nonetheless, in a far-flung colony such as India, there were British-controlled monopolies. A good example of this was a law against Indians creating their own cloth. For thousands of years, Indians had been uh, had a series of home um, spinning 
uh, traditions, basically creating cloth out of cotton and other fibers. Well, now that was considered illegal in the 1850s all the way to the 1940s. And to make your own cloth uh, would is essentially a imprisonable offense. It wasn't just a fine. They would stick you in prison and, you know, that was never a pleasant experience anyway. Uh, so India became the number one purchaser of British textiles. So why? Why was that so important? We got to think back in England in the 1850s, we're reaching the point in which countries like Germany and the United States and others are becoming competitive with Britain. You've got a lot of factories who are owned by a lot of capitalists who are very eager to see their profits continue, who are very eager to see jobs continue to be filled and are very eager to see markets opened. Well, the best way to do that is to ensure a captive market. Now, in order to prevent any kind of direct strike back, uh, there was a very layered approach to this kind of colonialism in India. And uh, it was all based on this idea of social Darwinism, that somehow white people were just more superior. As we see here, uh, a, a woman who is being carried around in a sedan, uh, that's what this was called. She's basically a chair with a bunch of poles pushed through it. Uh, and she was carried around by young uh, Indian men who were basically her um, mode of transportation, <laughs> the best way to describe it. Uh, and this is all based on racial discrimination. Uh, it was believed that uh, they were happier being enslaved, well, being uh, coerced into labor for very low price, not literally enslaved, because that would be anti-British and against the British laws. Uh, and this uh, layered governance also exploited this concept of divide and rule, the idea of pitting communities against each other, communities that already had a long-standing simmering dislike for each other. And also a lot of the infrastructure that was built up in India, whether it be governance, roads, railroads, canals, uh, telegraph lines, or ports, were all structured around uh, removing as much resources as possible from India and sending them off to England to be processed, where they would come back and be sold back to India. Kind of an ironic situation there. So how did, higher, how did this layered division actually work? Well, there was actually a hierarchy in India. And essentially, to, to boil it down to most simple terms, the, the British basically instituted this idea that the lighter skinned you were, the higher you were within this administration. The top to be top of the people, of course, are those white administrators who come from England. Uh, they are the very top. Uh, it is very difficult to um, argue any other way than uh, the white people coming over to India were treated much, much better by the British government than the people who were non-white, whether they came to India or were born there. In general, the British government divided India into two large communities. You have the Hindu community and the Muslim community. And the British administration dealt with the leadership of either of these communities individually. They never really encouraged any kind of cooperation and in many cases exacerbated the differences. A good example of this would be later on in the late 19th century when reformers within England argue for the opening of administrative positions, low ranking administrative positions within the Indian government to native born Indians, more often than not, Muslims were preferred over Hindus. Why? Well, Muslims were monotheists and were seen as a little bit more, uh, um, more Western-like uh, because of their monotheistic faith. Uh, Hindus were seen as impulsive, erratic, polytheistic, more barbaric, and you'll see that play out in 20th and even 21st century politics. If you've paid attention to any of the issues that are happening in India right now, there are a series of riots and uh, anti-Muslim um, pogroms that are happening in India as we speak. Uh, and that's largely due to this Hindu-Muslim divide that was exacerbated by English rule uh, and definitely not helped. Now, essentially, the, the administrators allowed the 
people who were in charge of these communities to take care of their respective cultures. There was no direct rule, no direct attempt to change the cultures of Hindus, Muslims, or uh, the other small minorities like uh, Buddhists or Christians or Jews or whatever that were living in India. Those were all left up to their varying culture communities. So if, for example, there was an issue about marriage or uh, about funeral rites or about um, the way that a community dealt with uh, local offenders, uh, that was all left up to the different communities. So things like caste issues uh, and those cultural issues that I spoke about just a second ago, those were all left up to the individual leaders. And in many ways, these individual leaders were, were seen as kind of uh, buffer zones between the whites who did the administration and allowed plausible deniability for the, uh, for the white administrators. So where does this 3C mission come in? And we talked about this last week and was on the quiz. The three Cs are uh, civilization, commerce, and Christianity. So where does this 3C mission come in? Well, to the British mindset, the best way to ensure civilization was to make other societies emulate England as much as possible. So there was very much a push for English identity. Uh, there were English only schools. They were not allowed to have uh, state supported schools that taught Hindi or that taught uh, Urdu or taught any other language had to be English only schools. More so the courts, any kind of justice had to be carried out in English. Also official decrees, laws, whatever, curfews, you name it, they were all always in English. So what does this mean if you don't speak English? Well, ignorance of the law is never defense, at least not in English law, in English uh, jurisprudence. So being ignorant of the law just meant you were at that much more of a disadvantage. If you didn't speak English, you couldn't get into the schools. If you didn't speak English, you couldn't represent yourself in court, let alone understand what was going on. And you couldn't understand the laws that were coming out. So you were increasingly powerless. Higher education, for example, was also very much English oriented. Um, there was a, a very good example of this when we talk about uh, the legal reforms, when we finally get to the African, I'm um, sorry, the Indian National Congress, the laws <laughs> and the schooling for these laws were all held in England. Uh, and so in order to be able to get your law degree, you had to travel to England, which means your family had to be fairly affluent. They had to be able to support you while you were there. And so a lot of these uh, a lot of these barriers were kind of put into the into the way of a lot of uh, native born Indians. Um, even within uh, even within the country, there was a lot of discrimination. Theoretically, these administrative uh, positions like uh, being a clerk, being uh, a, a bureaucratic official, being an interpreter, uh, whatever, these were technically open to local uh, local residents or local subjects, but it was extremely restrictive access. Uh, about one in 900 or a little bit over 900 applicants would be accepted within these programs. So it was extremely competitive to get in, extremely difficult to get in. And of course, once you were in, you didn't want to rock the boat. So you didn't want to try to like break apart the system because you could very easily be fired and there would be 899 or so more applicants who would be happy to take your place. So this kind of coerced a lot of the bureaucrats, a lot of the middle class into going along with this administrative layering. Outside the country, uh, if they were traveling outside the country, they were dealt as, uh, as minorities. They were dealt as black. Uh, with the exception of England, uh, most of the colonies had some kind of official um, apartheid kind of attitude towards uh, non-whites. Uh, 
good example of this is uh, a young Mohandas Gandhi in the 1890s traveled to South Africa to litigate on behalf of Indians who were working in South Africa, arguing that they were not black because they weren't born in Africa. To a lot of the um, a lot of the people, a lot of the uh, governors in South Africa, for example, it it was a difference without a distinction. Uh, so what? They're both dark skinned. They're both dark haired. They're both less civilized. But in Gandhi's case, he saw uh, Indians as perhaps maybe equal to, if just slightly below, uh, if not slightly below english citizens and so he argued for their whiteness and that was a lot of the pivoting around uh that legal issue in england even though there wasn't overt um overt discrimination like the uh relegation to second class citizenship there was still a lot of social ostracization uh they would be left out of social events which was incredibly critical to change hearts and minds uh to get anything done in the english parliament to agitate for any real change. Now, back at home, um, India <clears throat> had a very, very large population, second largest population historically in the world. And that was due in no small part to the wide variety of foods that were available to be grown. A lot of arable land throughout most of India's history was devoted to the creation of food crops, vegetables, grains, you name it. Uh, and for the most part, that really did work. Uh, a lot of empires that had arisen in India had really focused on protecting farmers and protecting farmers animals. Uh, one of the first veterinary clinics that had ever opened up in any civilization opened up in India. And that was largely to make sure that, uh, that oxen and other beasts of burden would be there to uh, help the, the farmers plow. It's kind of like a, opening up a national mechanics garage to make sure that the, the farmers tractors still work. It's the same equivalent. Now, um, under British rule, however, there was an increasing push towards the collection of modernized taxes. Now, historically, a lot of taxes in um, in civilizations were, were service in kind or they were uh, goods in exchange for money. So, for example, if you were a farmer, you probably didn't have a lot of cash on hand, but you did bring in a lot of oats, for example. So maybe you would pay one out of every nine bushels of oats towards the king or towards the landlord to pay for your upkeep or maybe three out of six or if it was extremely uh, high level of rent so you never really had cash and it was taken in as uh, part and parcel well with this increasingly modernized economy with this increasingly mechanized focused economy there became more of a drive towards uh, collection of fees, the collection of cash from taxpayers. So we started seeing this, uh, this removal of land from uh, production of food and geared more and more towards what's called a cash crop economy. Things like opium, tea, cotton, or linen, which then creates, uh, uh, or flax, which then creates linen. Uh, these are called cash crops because they're worth more than cereal crops. They're worth more than food, but they can't be eaten. So over time, you see the disappearance of some crops. And the system is robust enough as it stands to maybe with, withstand a little bit of tweaking and a little bit of devotion of some of that land towards more cash crops. But of course, as it generates more money, there comes a desire to charge more in rents, to charge more in fees, to charge more in taxes, and all of those to be carried out in cash. So then you have more vegetables, more cereals disappearing in favor of things like tea or cotton or opium, as we talked about uh, last week with the opium wars, and increasingly more. 
and increasingly more. And eventually you get to a tipping point where there's not enough food being produced, not enough food being imported because it's relatively expensive to import food compared to growing it at home. And so prices for, for uh, food raise and it prices the poorest of the poor out of being able to feed themselves. And so what happens is exactly what happened in the 1860s and 1870s in India, widespread famine. Now at the same time, there is a large population. That population can't help but grow because as you need more help on the land to grow these cash crops, crops like cotton, and tobacco are very labor intensive, so you need more hands. There's less of an emphasis by landlords on mechanization, labor saving devices. It's just cheaper in the short run to keep hiring a bunch of hands. And if they starve, say la vie. That's the invisible hand of fate, the invisible hand of capitalism at play there. Perhaps you should have fewer babies. That sort of attitude prevailed in India. So growing population, the uh, the efficiency of the system was increasingly strained by this growing population. You have less food, you have more cash crops going out, and eventually you have famine. Famine is not a, generally, is not a natural occurrence. Most primitive societies, going all the way back to the Bronze Age and even before, had methods of dealing with widespread famine. There would be hunger, yes, but the systems were in place by local governments to deal with that, to mitigate that. That wasn't happening in, in India as much. And so you have this failure of the entire governance system. Now, who gets blamed under this? Well, you get an angry underclass that is increasingly angry at their local administrators. And as I mentioned before, as we move through the 19th century, we start having more and more local middle class, local elites who are bearing the brunt of this anger. And so it agitates some of the middle class. And some of this middle class begins to see the, the, the misery that is inflicted by English policies in the 19th century. So why focus on the middle class? Why, why do we look at the middle class and not the princes or maybe the peasants? Well, one of the good reasons why we focus on the middle class is because the middle class, especially in, in India, are the ones who start getting things done. They start making reforms. They are anglified enough that they can work within the system. And they're not as, um, they're not seen as, as as emotional by the English administrators. They're also able to manipulate the system in order to exact change within the mechanisms of the system. So it's very incremental change. So why exclude the middle class though from things like uh, travel and hotels if this middle class was necessary to the administration of India? Well, part of it is that racial component. It's hard to separate people from their emotions. Uh, the English appreciated and needed the middle-class Indians in order to keep the country running and to act as that buffer, that middle kind of uh, 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 impact absorbency from the lower classes. But at the same time, they couldn't quite bring them to say intermarry or to allow to travel in first class or to stay in really the swankiest hotels, the most elite hotels, they could not stay in there. They just could not bring themselves, the English could not bring themselves to allow locals of any type to hobnob with the elites. So we eventually do get a, a push for reform, and this is a, largely in response to some of the social unrest that is happening in the 1860s and 1870s in India. And this uh, comes in the form of the Indian National Congress, which are created largely from a group of well-educated middle-class people who were mostly lawyers. So why lawyers though? Well, A, the 
Indian National Congress was a kind of sort of advisory body to the viceroy of India, the the um, kind of deputy king. That's what viceroy literally means, kind of a deputy king. The lawyers understood English law well enough that they could operate within the system without it having to be explained to them. So very little training time. But also these lawyers, if you remember how expensive it was to send a child, a male child, off to England to learn English law at places like Oxford you or Cambridge. You needed to be invested in the system and keep keep it going. So they were very wealthy. They were very well versed in English customs. They were very well versed in English uh, traditions and jurisprudence. So they seemed like the natural choice to comprise the body of this Indian National Congress, that they would be advisory enough to make incremental change that would maybe act as a pressure relief valve for the lower classes, but also not so uh, invested in change that they would upend the system that saw them very near the top. So it was founded at the suggestion of colonial administrators uh, as a platform for, uh, for the democratic voice of the people. Uh, as it kind of, as I mentioned before, this kind of release valve for the tensions that are building up, and also to advise the viceroys on the little nuances of administering in India. And it seemed like a pretty good idea in the 1880s. So India becomes, as Queen Victoria once quipped, the jewel in the crown of, of British royalty. Uh, India acts as many things to Britain. It is a market, uh, so a place of extreme economic importance. As we mentioned before, 40% of the textiles created in England go to India to be sold. So that's a huge market. They're also a supplier. Uh, things like tea, which is very culturally British, very, very culturally British, and cotton, which is keeping the mills going, for example. There's also that level of prestige that we touched on when we were looking at that matrix of influences that create colonization. Having such a big subcontinent under the thumb of the English was quite the uh, feather in the cap of the British royalty, thus the jewel in the crown. But it's also a potential problem. There's a lot of social issues, a lot of economic issues that we're really not going to get into, but they're there. They're simmering. Uh, there's the, a lot of a divide between the haves and have nots, between the administrators and the administrated. Uh, and really, even though the English National uh, Indian National Congress is very Anglified and English ish. Uh, they're not quite the perfect vehicle to see uh, the monumental changes that need to happen within India. So let's skip over to China now that we've kind of left India in the hands of, of time. We will see how that plays out in a future lecture when we get into World War I. And we're going to look at China in the 1850s to about the cusp of the uh, First World War. Now, I, I mentioned before in a previous lecture that uh, the Qing Dynasty, which is the last real dynasty of, uh, of China, is in a free fall, uh, although uh, historians like to use the term decline. Uh, this is a precipitous fall. Uh, in the 1840s, China had the largest army wasn't the most well-equipped army, obviously, wasn't the most well-disciplined army. It was relatively scattered uh, and was easily overwhelmed by mechanized, uh, well-drilled, smaller armies. But it had this massive army. It had massive trade surplus, lots of silver coming in from overseas, not a lot going out, had a booming population. But between the 1840s and by the time we get to the late 1850s, by the time the second Opium War is over, uh, the fortunes of China have truly reversed. Uh, the, the Opium Wars have left with staggering losses. It was not only a military blow, but a psychological blow and a cultural blow and an economic blow. Culturally, you have a lot of uh, this, this, this poison, for lack of a better term, this opium flooding into the markets. 
easily acceptable. Uh, and in exchange, a lot of the silver that had been ac accumulated over the past several hundred years uh, since the plundering of the Western Hemisphere has really begun to kind of shift out. A lot of that silver is beginning to drain out of, of China, assisted in no small part by the reparations that were forced upon China. Uh, I have a number here of 24 million ounces. It's the equivalent of uh, billions and billions of dollars. I think the, the the last calculation I did was somewhere around the around the the realm of like 19 billion dollars, uh, something along those lines. And so this causes a contracting economy. So you don't have as much wealth. Uh, there's a lot more competition for resources. And this, of course, leads to poverty and hunger. Uh, not quite famine yet, although we will have a couple of famines in this, and that's largely due to the ineffectual uh, ability of the Qing dynasty to really govern, partly due to uh, institutional failures, partly due to the losses that happen uh, and the misconfidence that local governors have, and also partly due to outside interference. But you still have an expanding population. You, it's very difficult to stop that expansion of the population. It had been uh, building and building and building all the way to the 1840s. It's not like people are suddenly going to stop having babies. And a lot of times people think, oh, well, we're, we need a third kid or we need a fourth kid to be able to help bring in more crops so we can farm more land. Well, that also means more people. And so if everybody thinks, well, we need a third or a fourth or a fifth or a sixth child in order to help on the farms, well, you have this kind of growing need to feed people and increasingly the infrastructure begins to fall apart. So as I mentioned before, there was some uh, influences that, uh, external influences that really uh, messed with the ability of the Qing dynasty to recover from the losses of the Opium Wars. Had the Opium Wars happened, uh, and it, it not be an ongoing thing. Maybe the Qing Dynasty could have repaired things like they did after the first Opium War, possibly could have recovered. But after the second uh, Opium War, Britain is given uh, something called a most favored nation status, which means they get to dictate a lot of terms to the Chinese government. Uh, a good example of that would be a lot of automatic concessions, things that were given away to the British. Uh, the, the right of the British to operate, of British uh, subjects to operate in China I immune to Chinese laws, for example, is, another, is a really good uh, concession that really undermines the Qing dynasty. And of course, it wasn't like the Qing could just say no to that. They had just lost two devastating wars. And it wasn't like that uh, that foreign navy and that foreign army were going to go anywhere anytime soon. And they had no way to respond. So basically, as I mentioned before, gunboat diplomacy. Uh, it's easier to get what you want with a kind word in the gun than just a kind word. Now, once Britain has these concessions, immediately other world powers begin to show up with their navies and their armies and begin to demand what we refer to as a slice of the Chinese melon. And this is a, a, a quote taken directly from a British uh, uh, diplomat in the 1890s where he was talking about how the, the Europeans had come in and basically carved up China as if it were a prized melon, a very sweet melon. And so you have France, Germany, Japan, Italy, Spain, all vying for bits and pieces of, of China. Uh, why? Well, China had a lot of natural resources, things like coal and steel, of course, but also tea, silk, dyes, exotic foods, you name it. It had a lot of things that the Europeans want. And then when we get closer to the 20th century, and as the um, refinement of petrochemicals becomes more real, there's vast resources of oil to be found in places like Manchuria. Uh, and so there's this, this desire for extraction of resources. And because you have these different influences, because you have uh, these kind of autonomous provinces, or the I shouldn't say autonomous, uh, because you have these differing um, areas that are administered by, let's say, France or Italy or Japan, uh, you have a divided populace. And within that 
within that greater Chinese territorial claim within those little divisions, uh, let's say within the German enclave, uh, you have a very divide and rule kind of attitude because that was the most effective way to ensure that you would have uh, the resources extracted with the least amount of trouble. Uh, so they directly deal, dealt with governors, warlords, uh, local magistrates, people who had power and influence and used their corruption to help further divide the empire. And if the governor is listening to, let's say, the English ambassador more than the uh, Chinese emperor, the Chinese emperor, if he doesn't have anybody who's listening to him, he's just a guy with a fancy chair, basically. So as a Chinese subject, I want you to think about living and working in a Chinese city or maybe out in the countryside. And you, what are you, what would you see the root causes of Chinese weakness being? Would it be these foreigners coming in or would it be corruption? Would it be a distant, ineffectual central government? What would you do to try to tra tackle this, this overwhelming humiliation of China? Well, there was one response, and that is the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, the Taiping Rebellion was led by a fundamentalist Christian uh, cult leader uh, who referred to himself as, I think he said he was Jesus's older or younger brother, uh, something like that. He was Jesus' younger brother. He was essentially immortal. He had come to China to preach uh, a, a, a gospel of salvation and strength. Uh, it was a very fundamentalist movement. It was uh, deeply opposed to anything that might create an altered state. So anti-alcohol, anti-drugs, uh, they were also anti-sin. Uh, anything that they deemed a sin uh, was was uh, immediately quashed out, often very violently. So if you were a prostitute, you could probably be killed. Uh, if you were a drug user, you were also killed. Uh, if you were uh, uh, a criminal who stole, you'd probably have hands lopped off, that sort of thing. Very, very uh, stringent. Uh, cultish uh, reaction to crime and the nuanced causes of crime. Uh, but they were also into, uh, into rectifying some of the issues and some of the discrepancies that were happening within Chinese society. Uh, a good example of this is um, traditional Chinese society, uh, the Qing dynasty was not alone in this, uh, saw men as superior to women. But this Taiping Rebellion, this, this fundamentalist movement, uh, said, argued that all men and women were the children of God and therefore were socially equal. So you had this very male-female equality. So women could hold po positions of authority. Um, men could uh, be held to the same standards as women were for their uh, moral turpitude or their moral standings. It was no longer that, oh, the prostitute is the, is the poison. Well, also the customer of the prostitute or the male prostitute was just as bad as a female prostitute. They also engaged in land reform of, of taking away land from uh, very wealthy landowners, even if this meant foreign landowners, and giving it back to farmers so they could farm an agrarian paradise. And they also held all property in, in um, social community. In other words, they were a very communist or communist uh, uh, society. And this was based largely on the writings of, or an interpretation of the writings of the, of the gospel of the New, uh, the New Testament, um, where Jesus talked about uh, sharing amongst the community, that the community looks out for each other, uh, the Sermon on the Mount with the fishes and loaves. He asks a few people to give up their, you know, a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread. And miraculously, when the greedy give up, what they have, what they're holding on to, what they're hoarding, there's enough for everybody to be filled and satiated. Uh, when he talks, when Jesus talks about uh, if somebody sues you for your cloak, give them your tunic as well. Don't hold on to property. It's just going to slow you down. Uh, and eventually that person will feel the weight of their own greed, uh, that sort of thing. 
Well, they they last for a good long time, for about about 13 years before uh, it, before the uh, the end begins to kind of collapse in on them. Um, this civil war had basically carved out a uh, um, a separate distinct province or a separate distinct almost country pseudo country in the southern part of china and it was put down not by the qing government but by local warlords who had been uh working closely with foreign powers so they have new military armaments they've been drilled in european ways of fighting uh and of course they want to capture that territory because um the Europeans wanted that territory back, not so much that the Qing did. Although nominally, when they did reconquer it, they said they were doing it in the name of the Qing dynasty. The Qing really had no um, say and no way to take that territory back any other way. Because as I mentioned before, if you have an emperor who has nobody who's listening to him, just a guy in a fancy chair, that's it. Uh, so he was relying on uh, governors to maybe go in and or warlords to go in and maybe take that territory back. It wasn't happening. Not until the Europeans decided, OK, enough's enough. We need that territory back. So we have this kind of quasi colonialism. The, the, the Europeans, no European country becomes the ruler of China writ large. Europeans never directly control China. Instead, they operate with spheres of influence, which is an even, even deeper layer. Uh, they're not even really there. Uh, they they kind of are, but they're not. They're not the administrators. They leave the administration in the hands of locals. Um, even more aggravating, though, is not so much that they're not really there, that Europeans are not really there. There are some Europeans who are there, but the administrators are not, uh, is the fact that even when Europeans are there, they're immune to laws. Uh, so they're immune to Chinese laws and the infrastructure largely, anything, railroads, canals, uh, docks, you name it, those are for European use only. So you can imagine uh, the uh, house across the street from you is being built up and it's all gorgeous and it's got you know fiber optic cable and it's got uh all this this wonderful wonderful stuff and you want some of that wonderful stuff too maybe you want clean water maybe you want electricity maybe you want internet as well well you can't even touch it because across the street it's somebody it's some other country's resident and they get priority they get that you can't even touch it uh you can't even uh use the road you can't even use the telegraph you can't use any of that and of course this is all geared towards resource extraction we mentioned that before uh and of course this leads to the exploitation of the rural and the poor the poorer you are the more removed you are from the from the cities the more likely you are to be exploited in this system uh and in general just just in general so this leads to a movement called the self-strengthening movement. By the time we get to 1890s, uh, there's a, a kind of new neo-nationalist uh, movement within China. And the society that really spearheads this reformist movement it refers to itself as the righteous and harmonious fists. And they were very egalitarian as well. They had uh, men who would learn uh, Kung Fu and martial arts fighting styles, uh, fighting with spears, uh, with traditional swords and that sort of thing, uh, and even farming implements. Um, but also women were taught to fight, to be able to defend themselves. Uh, the women who participated in this kind of movement were often referred to as the Red Lanterns. Uh, they were the ones who guided the way for the for the the men who would often direct battles or they would tell them where to fight next and that sort of thing uh, some of these reformist movements particularly the righteous and harmonious fist uh, were upset at the very hit and miss way in which china was being modernized some governors remained independent of foreign influence but also remained independent of 
Qing dynasty influence. And they began to really invest in local infrastructure, building up roads, uh, modernizing uh, agriculture, uh, schools, unit, hospitals, you name it. These things were really uh, beginning to bloom in certain areas not so much in another area so again much like seeing that house across the street getting all the really good stuff and you're left out in the cold uh is very aggravating interestingly enough the um the Qing dynasty had been slowly feeding money to these um, reformist groups through intermediaries, kind of like a, a shadow pack, if you will, to use our current term terminology. Uh, it was just kind of filtered and laundered through a bunch of different channels. Uh, but historians are increasingly convinced and there is a lot of evidence that uh, the Qing dynasty was actually helping fuel these, hoping for a populist uprising, because if millions, hundreds of millions of Chinese uh, were really, really angry, there was no army that the foreigners could mount that would possibly ever put them down. Now, in interestingly enough, uh, the reformist movements, especially the Righteous and Harmonious Fist, were increasingly anti-central government, anti-Qing. They saw the Qing as corrupt, as lazy, as letting the foreigners walk on them. And of course, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the lecture, uh, the Righteous and Harmonious Fist in particular were very anti-foreigner. China for the Chinese. And so in 1900, we have this, this so-called Boxer Rebellion. Now, where did it get the term Boxer? Well, largely because of the fighting style was mostly unarmed. Uh, a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, rebels, or I, I hate to call them rebels, let's say nationals, a lot of these revolutionaries were poor peasants who didn't have very much, but they learned to defend themselves with well, and and also go on the attack with martial arts with hand-to-hand -hand combat and that um concept that concept of fighting was very foreign to the to the europeans who just basically saw it as a form of boxing uh much like fisticuffs and you know like you would see you know muhammad ali or whatever uh and so the description in a lot of the newspapers termed these guys boxers. Uh, these, these, this idea of coming up and pounding the the foreigners into submission with their with their fists. Uh, in reality, a lot of these uh, a lot of these nationalists were attacking soldiers, and they were taking arms away. They would they would uh, overcome the soldiers, beat them into submission, sometimes kill them, and take the weapons so that they could then fuel the uh, fueled the rebellion. Uh, a lot of this uh, uh, this was sparked by a recent loss again of territory from Japan, uh, a building resentment against foreign re uh, influence, and an attempt to cop topple uh, the ineffective government. And it takes place in Beijing. Um, Beijing was was uh, uh, the center of not only government, but also where a lot of the resident embassies were. Uh, the foreign interference, however, the foreigners uh, barricade themselves in the resident embassies, some more successfully than others. They send out uh, panicked uh, messages to their home governments, and there's this coalition that, that comes in and really stamps out uh, this rebellion. Unfortunately, it never really gets a, a uh, uh, it never really gets its footing underneath it. And so we have uh, between 1900, I mean, sorry, 1800 and 1900, we have what historians and a lot of Chinese refer to as the culmination of China's century worth of humiliation. Uh, in 1800, China had the largest army in the world, the richest economy in the world, was advanced and learned. By the time we get to 1900, it's divided up by foreigners, it has a weak, ineffectual government, and it's largely devastated, ripe for disease and famine. And this political cartoon is actually a very uh, important way to see um, how Europeans viewed the fate of China. Now, China here, it's a very obviously very racist cartoon because it's from the 1900, uh, early uh, uh, 1900s or late 18, 1800s. 
you can see it's very racist so it's got a very caricature face for the slain chinese dragon and it truly was a dragon and who is fighting over the body well we've got a lot of animals fighting over it but there there's a lot of symbolism behind that uh we have the english uh empire that is very um uh, ferocious uh this this lion amongst the rest uh facing off against the russian empire which is the bear and he's got a a cossack's cavalry sword but you also have the united states uh japan uh italy uh we also have spain and of course in the very top there uh, uh germany and their Eng eagle uh outfit all looking to take a piece of the carcass of the slain chinese dragon the dragon had represented power and prestige and invulnerability and now that they had defeated it now they were at each other's throats to divvy it up so there were by the time we get to the 20th century there are many chinas for lack of a better term under the influence of a bunch of foreigners they're China is largely outstripped by its rivals, particularly Japan, which we're about to move into, and they become a captive market for Europeans. A lot of um, a lot of Chinese begin to leave uh, China in the middle of the 1800s, uh, going to foreign ports. Some of them are kidnapped or shanghaied uh, and brought to places like Australia, the United States, to South America, where they work as semi-indentured servants. Not true slaves, but they didn't go willingly in many cases. Some, however, do, and they form very uh, deep community ties uh, in places like San Francisco, Idaho, Wyoming, uh, in throughout California, throughout the Western coast, and even begin to filter into places like New York City. Let's move on to Japan. Japan is perhaps a interesting case study, an unusual turn of event for Asia, uh, in that Japan is never really colonized by foreigners. Comes close a couple of times, but never really ever becomes a subject nation. And we'll see why in just a moment here. Now, in the 1850s, Japan is a largely closed society. We've touched upon many lectures ago that there was only 13 people who were allowed to interact with Japan at any one time. 13 foreigners, that is. Uh, travel outside of Japan was banned. Anybody who traveled outside of Japan was immediately seen as a pirate and to be dealt with uh, uh, if they ever got caught traveling outside of Japan they would be crucified where they were found as pirates. So even if you were just a, a merchant who was traveling abroad to trade goods in China or Indonesia or, uh, uh, or Vietnam, you would be seen as a pirate and uh, summarily executed if you were caught. So there was a vibrant black market. So, but in general, the society was very, um, stifled it was very ossified very very set in stone uh and that was largely due to the tokugawa shogunate uh the shogunate had very uh had kept the reins on power for several hundred years and by 1853 was really a uh an ineffectual uh government in dealing with foreign interference they had largely relied upon threat of sinking ships uh, that had come calling into the harbor by using essentially 17th century or 18th century, early 18th century cannons that were set in fortifications around all the harbors. Well, by 1853, we get steamships and particularly American steamships. And the United States, which had conducted trade during the Napoleonic Wars on behalf of the exiled Dutch government, saw the value of trading in Japan. Not for what Japan has, at least not in its territory, but what it has in its waters. In the waters off of Japan was one of the seasonal migration routes for humpback whales and whale oil was priceless in ensuring the industrial revolution could continue uh, 
However, stocks of whales were dwindling. Humans had hunted whales to the brink of extinction all throughout the western coast of the Americas and the eastern coast, well, most of the Atlantic as well. And so they were searching further and further afield. As they got close to Japan, their chance of accidentally getting too close to some of those territorial forts, or if there was a storm and sailors were washed up on shore, uh, there was always that chance they would wash up on a Japanese shore. And of course, as I mentioned before, if you were caught being a foreigner in Japan, you were crucified because you were a pirate, period. End of discussion. No trial, no way to talk your way out of it. You were dead. So the United States in 1853, led by Commodore Perry, shows up in, uh, in Edo Harbor, which is the former major hub of, of trade that used to go for uh, further afield and shows up with modern guns that can easily hit the fortifications and the Japanese guns could not possibly reach uh, the ships. So a forcible opening of ports is the perfect gunboat diplomacy. Listen, we want to trade with you. You're going to let us trade with you or we're going to level each and every one of your cities from the safety of the ocean. Uh, and this creates kind of an ex existential crisis for the government, for the, the shogunate. Uh, it upends the power structure that had been, uh, calls into question the ability of the shogunate to defend itself, and leaves it open to critique, very loud and vociferous critique, uh, by some uh, factions that had been left out of the power scheme. Uh, so some elites, uh, in particular, the emperor, who had long been a figurehead in Japanese society. Uh, and so when the shogunate begins to crumble into that vacuum steps, a new resurgent emperor. For the first time in about a thousand years, the emperor is beginning to exert direct control over Japan, rather than being just a figurehead and the one who nominates new shoguns. So that warlord class is gone and it begins to crumble, but it doesn't go away quietly. This plunges Japan into a civil war, actually a couple of different civil wars. Now, why was Japanese society so antagonistic to outside influence? Well, on one hand, uh, Japanese society was um, fascinated with outside learning, the so-called Dutch learning. Uh, why was it Dutch learning? Well, that's how they got most of their books. Most of the books were in Dutch, and uh, a lot of Japanese taught themselves to read Dutch so that they could read these illegal books that were smuggled in by these traders. Told you there was a black market. Uh, and it was kept secret, kind of an open secret, for several centuries. Well, they so it wasn't that the citizens of japan were ignorant of what was happening outside they were just not allowed to respond or act in any way to adapt or or adopt new styles this is largely due to the tokugawa shogunate's emphasis on social stability and there's a difference between social stability and social ossification or turning into bone, turning into stone, uh, becoming uh, in inflexible and by that, uh, by that same token, brittle. Uh, so the society was largely frozen in time. Now its neighbors, it was very aware, were under tremendous pressure. Uh, they did know about the opium wars. They did know about what was happening in India, and they wanted no part of it. They thought maybe if they close all the blinds, turn off all the lights, they would pretend like nobody's home and the Europeans would pass them by. One of the reasons why the Europeans passed them by up until 1850 was because Japan really didn't have very many rich resources to be exploited, at least not ones that couldn't be found elsewhere. Silk, China had that. Uh, tea, China and India had that. Iron, yeah, we got lots of that. Coal, got lots of that as well. So not really a lot of resources. Some whales, yeah, eventually that does force the uh, the Japanese to open up. As I mentioned, that, that civil war is a, uh, a, a fracturing of the two ways of looking at the world. In the old way, uh, the samurai way, 
is that uh, the traditions that had held Japanese society together for such a very long time were under direct threat and a faction within Japan needed to rise up and ensure that the Japanese way of life didn't disappear in the face of modernity. The other faction, and one led by the emperor, was this idea of modernization. Modernization is inevitable. Looking to the past and holding on to the past leaves us vulnerable. It leaves us uh, possibly at the low end of the totem pole. Eventually, Europeans are going to decide they're going to want to uh, add Japan or the Japanese islands the way that they'd been carving up China. So we need to either adapt or we will die. And so we have this series of wars that ends the old feudal Japan. Perhaps the most famous is the Boshin War, often depicted um, rather fantastically in the Tom Cruise movie, The Last Samurai. Uh, it's, it's really the final gasp of this very old way of life uh, that gets very much romanticized in the late uh, late 19th century maybe early 20th century becomes romanticized and it again gets romanticized even now in the 20th century and the 21st century uh, so the the boshin war essentially pits uh the traditional japanese samurai class who were not afraid of using guns as opposed to uh at, in much in contrast to the to the film that I mentioned about the Last Samurai, uh, against a new westernized modern army that was very disciplined, drawn from the working class, the rural people who were trained to be professional armies, and the result is predictably disastrous for the samurai, uh, the samurai who had you know thrown themselves uh, into the guns basically of the uh of the imperial army uh were essentially wiped out and this leaves japan with only one narrative and that is to move forward to look forward to modernize to westernize and so we get this period known as the Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration is this kind of revisiting of the power of the emperor. And it's called the Meiji Restoration because the emperor at the time was a man named Meiji. Uh, he's the one who really kind of is the engine for a lot of this change. Uh, he reformed society from the top down. A lot of the discussion about modernization in Europe has been about the flexibility and the power of entrepreneurs and individual uh, market uh, forces, about uh, flexibility, about a laissez-faire kind of government attitude, that somehow England was able to build this robust economy because of the light governance. And that leads one to believe that only a light governance can create a strong, robust uh, industrial policy or a strong, robust economic policy. Japan puts that theory on its head. The Japanese modernization is very much top down. It is very much dictated to the different provinces. For example, there's social reform. Education is opened up made free to everyone, and it is very, 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 uh, uh, very influenced by American school systems in that it is merit-based, that those who work hard, who show that they can do the work, who show that they grasp the concepts, are the ones who will be promoted, who will be, uh, you know, uh, summa cum laude or magna cum laude, uh, who will be the ones who are honored the most. They will be given the most opportunities. Now, it's interesting to note that in the 19th century, this was very much a, a, an American innovation in, in education. It was believed in Europe that there were different layers of education, that the elite people, the people who were born into wealth and privileges, obviously had better talent. So there was still a little bit of that social attitude and so they were given the best opportunities the best 
uh, schooling, the best uh, education possibilities. And the people who were lower and lower down, even if they were really smart, would never really get ahead. Uh, they could get a little bit ahead, maybe a little bit better than their parents had, maybe, and in hopes that, they, that their children would do better than them and their grandchildren would do better than that. Uh, Japan, absolute opposite. America, absolute opposite. If you work hard, if you show that you have the right stuff, you can succeed. Uh, and that's upending the social hierarchy in Japan from the old uh, Japanese uh, shogunate model. Uh, they begin to unify the language. There was a lot of regional languages. Uh, they set out a single centrally dictated language with unified characters, with unified pronunciation. So that's why you get this very, uh, very uh, uniform Japanese uh, administration as well. Uh, the Maiji restoration goes about ensuring the industry is built up from the ground up. Uh, they dictate who gets to um, produce what. Uh, they also engage in a kind of monopolistic behavior. Uh, they give permission to produce, for example, playing cards, for example, to a small company known as Nintendo in 1889. Uh, these playing cards were made for an obscure uh, game, the uh, card game that had risen in Japan, was very popular in Japan, uh, and that success allowed the Nintendo company to expand and offer different kinds of cards for different kinds of uh, card games. Uh, a lot of them imported from Europe, things like uh, poker and uh, rummy and whist and uh, other kinds of card games. And then that card games parlayed into larger board games, into different types of games, chess and checkers and other games as well. Um, Nintendo, you may be familiar with now, has its roots over a century ago, a uh, century and what, three decades-ish? So uh, it obviously works very well. They, the Maiji Restoration also focuses on military growth because they see that uh, other European nations have these very effective, small, well-trained, well-equipped armies that are able to punch way above their weight. Good example is England defeating China. England had a much smaller army, had a much, much smaller army, uh, and yet was still able to defeat the Chinese army, even though they were uh, they were much larger. The Chinese army was much larger. It wasn't like it, the Chinese army was any slackers. They had gunpowder weapons, absolutely. They just weren't as well drilled. They weren't as modern in their equipment, and their their uh, command structure wasn't as modern. And so the Japanese begin to uh, restructure their military along French lines. Uh, they ask uh, French and uh, German uh, instructors to come over to their to their territory and teach them how to fight European style. Uh, kind of a premise that the uh, the the last samurai has. Uh, they would never have reached out to an American. Uh, America didn't really have that big of a of an army. wasn't really that well regarded in the 19th century, uh, but Germany and France were. So there's a new Japan and and we're on the cusp of a new century. By 1900, by about 1902, 1903, uh, Japan is a regional power. They go from a backwater to being able to project their power onto other countries. Uh, a good example would be the uh, the the uh, capturing of Manchuria uh, during the Sino-Japanese War in 1894, where a large chunk of northern China is gobbled up by the Japanese Empire, largely for resource extraction, things like coal and steel. Later on, that um, territorial acquisition becomes problematic for the Japanese because the Russians want it. And the Russians go to war against the Japanese. And in 1904, between 1904 and 1905, Japan fights the world's largest modern land empire. And one that had been industrializing for hundreds of years and beats them. The Japanese are beating the Russians so soundly that the United States depicted here in this picture, Teddy Roosevelt bringing the uh, the Tsar and the Emperor to the negotiation table. Teddy Roosevelt recognized that if 
Japan forces the defeat of Russia, this is going to leave a power vacuum in Europe. That power vacuum in Europe is going to be filled by a war. That war in Europe will engulf your uh, American interests and could possibly lead to a springboard to Japan claiming more territory in the Pacific, which again in her, in her <laughs> impinges upon American interests. So Japan is recognized as a colonial power. It has status by acquiring territory overseas in China, in uh, the uh, in South Pacific, uh, and it is also recognized as a military power, a world player. In less than 40 years, it goes from being a backwater to this amazing uh, territorial empire. And that's that's a breathtakingly quick turnaround. So what? Why was there such a uh, a disparity in the power? Well, part of the reason is indeed that the Japanese had much shorter supply lines. They had a much better trained army, had a much better trained navy, but also because that balance of power that we've been talking about in Europe. And you know how I mentioned just a moment ago that Teddy Roosevelt was worried about if uh, this victory were to allow to continue, if if Japan were to, to allow to uh, beat the living heck out of out of Russia, that this would lead to the collapse of Russia. That was one of the designs of this this war. Um, although the English were not really involved directly, they indirectly influenced the war by closing the Suez Canal to quote all combatants or all belligerents in 1904 and 1905 ostensibly was to keep war machines out of the Suez Canal and keep trade open. The reality was that it was more likely that the Russians were going to need to use the Suez Canal than the Japanese were. Um, the Japanese were fighting relatively close to home. The Russians had the majority of their ship creating ports on the western part of their territory in the Baltic. And so they would have to sail from the Baltic all throughout the Atlantic, down across the Mediterranean, go through the Suez Canal. They can get to Japan or at least to the Sea of Japan relatively quickly. By closing the Suez Canal to, quote, all combatants, uh, you force the Russians to go around the, uh, the continent of Africa, which increases the travel and the danger exponentially. So um, this leads to this humiliation for Russia. Uh, and in 1905, there is actually a revolution that nearly topples the Tsar of Russia. Uh, and it's led in no small part by a rebellious uh, battleship called Potemkin. Uh, the battleship Potemkin, uh, they overthrow their officers and they sail into the Black Sea and they're gonna liberate some uh, port cities. Uh, eventually they're they're put down, the, the, rebel, the mutiny is put down and the uh, rebellion is quashed in 1905, uh, but not without a massive loss of life. Uh, and this really gives you an idea of how fragile that peace and the stability of each of these European nations is. When Russia, which had been eh, moderately, moderately modernizing, uh, can be toppled by such a, a stunning loss. So let's compare uh, China and Japan's experience because they're, they're vastly different. Uh, in China, we have a central government which is not very effectual. It's increasingly devolving to decentralized governors who are ripe to being influenced or being intimidated by foreigners. And you have international interest in continued weakness of China. In Japan, however, you have a very effective central government. They win a civil war with a very modern uh, army with a lot of international support. They have a directed economy, so they have a lot of power invested not just in the military, but in the economy as well. They learn from foreigners, they bring foreigners over, teach them how to uh, create new machinery, which the Japanese do a wonderful job of. They very eagerly adapt a lot of this technology and improve it uh, in many cases. Um, 
And of course, there's uh, an interest, international interest in uh, or disinterest in Japan that eventually turns into maybe concern about the power of Japan. Uh, so essentially, international interests cannot stop Japan from its expansion. So the two countries could not have been more different in their experience in the 19th century. Uh, their positions are essentially flipped. So when we come into the early 20th century, we have Japan as an imperial power that has chunks of, of territory in China. It has Pacific islands. It's beginning to drill for oil, uh, which is much, much needed as increasingly rare whales become uh, prohibitively expensive as it seems petroleum is the new energy wave of the future. They become a world player. They defeat China and then they defeat Russia. Uh, they become a worry to the United States, to England, to the Netherlands, to others. Uh, but they're still facing anti discrimination. They're still facing discrimination. There's a lot of anti-Asian leagues uh, that are beginning to form around Japan. Then nominally, much like that uh, that statement that the Suez Canal was going to be closed to, quote, all belligerents, but it really meant to close it to Russia. Uh, this so-called anti-Asia league, uh, these agreements between Anglo-Americans and Anglo-Europeans um, to contain the spread of Asian influence, quote unquote, Asian influence, they sure as heck didn't mean China. And they sure as heck didn't mean India. They were not worried about India or China suddenly becoming resurgent and needing to be contained. Who were they talking about? Well, Japan. So here we are with some class questions. In India, England encouraged Englishness, but discriminated against the dark skin of Indians. How can you do that? Why? Why would you do that? Why would you encourage people to become as English as possible, but then still discriminate against them? In China, there were attempts at reform that had failed, leading to widespread insurrections. We have several rebellions, two of which we covered. Why would those attempts at reform lead to insurrection? Aren't we trying to get our act together? And then in Japan, what played a larger role in Japan's modernizing success, in your opinion? Do you think it was the lack of domestic resources or was it engaging in colonial expansion and showing that they could be as powerful as the Europeans? Or maybe it was a mixture of both.